Well, here we are again. Fully vaccinated, in the open, restrictions are lifting, don't need this anymore, hallelujah. It is a hot day out here in Mellon today. This is definitely straw hat and seersucker weather. As anyone who's experienced a Maryland, Virginia, Pennsylvania summer will know. So think about those troops fighting in the Eastern Theater that were wearing woolen uniforms and loaded with equipment, nine pounds of musket and 20 pounds of accoutrement and this, that and the other. This is hot weather for them to be working and fighting in and uh, certainly hot weather for a battlefield tour, but glorious weather. So partially in the shade here. Don't think I need the hat at the moment if the sun shifts. I will rely on the hat. Um, so how are we all doing? I hope we're all doing, doing well. I hope everybody's with the vaccine program. Celebrating not wearing masks anymore. We're all one of battlefield touring in the Eastern Theatre. Hydrate. If you go to Gettysburg, you go to Antietam. Manassas. Here at Monocacy, take water with you. There's always places to stop and get play, um, water and drinks from. There's a Wawa right up the street, about a mile and a half. But when you're out on the loop tours, there's not a lot going on. There's no cafeterias on some of these battlefields. So take water with you because in this weather you're going to need it. I'm definitely going to rely on this water later on. So just getting ready to start the tour at 1300 Eastern. So that's 1 p.m. my time. No idea what time that is in your time zone. I am not a math genius. I'm a history man. So, but thanks for tuning in. Um, saw some good response on the uh, Facebook event during the week as people were clicking their interest and expressing an interest in uh, watching today's tour. We are doing at the moment um, just a series of free tours because during the COVID lockdown, as you can appreciate, we're not allowed to gather in real groups. Um, this is not essential work. Um, I was not vaccinated at that time. Most people were not vaccinated. We were still wearing masks and separating from each other. And it was really not the done thing to have in-person battlefield tours. But So we've been running a series of trips out to Gettysburg, doing some touring from there, following individual regiments around particularly, such as Six Wisconsin or Dildra's Ohio Battery, things like that, doing micro tours at Gettysburg, just for fun, just to fill the time. We've done some Rev War stuff, we've done some War of 1812 stuff. Um, we've got a few more things, a few more events coming up on the Facebook page, check those out. We're going back out to Gettysburg next week. We're going to do the 16th Main, not the 20th Main, up on Round Top, 16th Main on the first day. Um, so fighting on the first day, the first morning of the Battle of Gettysburg, and then we're going to go across to New Jersey and Fort Mott, which is part of the harbour defences for the Delaware River, protecting Wilmington and uh, Philadelphia. And there's a series of harbour defences built there from the 1800s onwards. And Fort Mott was in use up until uh, World War II as harbour defences. We're going to crawl around the abandoned fort and uh, do a little tour over there, get some 18th century Civil War era stuff in, but also some World War One and World War Two. So anyway, here we are today at Monocacy, and uh, I guess it's around one o'clock, so we should get started. And excuse me if I occasionally duck down and grab my water bottle, but as I said, it's pretty warm out here today. So, but at the Battle of Monocacy, um, so it's July the 9th, 1864 known as the Battle That Saved Washington, maybe, maybe not. It's not as well known as many of the other uh, Eastern Theatre battles, so certainly not as well known as Gettysburg, certainly well, not as well known as Bull Run, Manassas, or Antietam, Sharpsburg, um, but it's a pivotal battle in its own way. Um, it does prevent an attack on, well it doesn't prevent, but it delays an attack on Washington. We don't know whether that success would have been that battle would have been successful 
or not. That's a counterfactual, we're not going to do that. Um, but at the time it was regarded as the battle that saved Washington DC and so that's kind of like the nickname that it had. Um, so we're out at Monocacy as I said. Um, Monocacy is a little bit south of Frederick, Maryland so I don't know whether you're familiar with the geography. Um, we are south of Frederick, Maryland, just a few miles. We are north of Washington DC. If you're on Washington DC on the DC Beltway and you come up Interstate 270 um, up Rockville and that will bring you to Frederick. In fact, 270 is about half a mile behind us at the moment. You might hear an echo of some traffic noise from there. I'm also right alongside the old B&O Railroad, which is now a CSX freight track. So we've had a couple of trains come through today, so if we are interrupted by a freight train, I'll just speak very loudly. Um, so we're north of Washington, D.C. Uh, we are west of Baltimore which is along Interstate 70, so Interstate 70 begins in Washington, no it doesn't, 270 begins in Washington, Interstate 70 begins just outside Baltimore in a parking lot, goes all the way across the country, if you want to drive to Denver from Baltimore, 1700 miles, have at it sooner you than me. Um, and so we're actually just a little bit south of Gettysburg, we're about 39, 40 miles, depending on where you stand on the battlefield in Gettysburg, south of Gettysburg, so if you are visiting Gettysburg and you are in the area, we're about an hour's drive south, um, down into no, down US 15, just follow US 15, all the way down into Frederick, um, pop in your GPS or on your phone maps for Monocacy National Battlefield Visitor Center, it'll bring you right across to the Visitor Center, the other side of Abana Pike, and uh, you'll be able to take a quick tour. Nice compact battlefield, um, you can spend as much time here as you want to, great place for picnicking. Um, some good walking trails but if you just want to pick up the map and drive the loop do the quick tour um, you can bus around here with your children in about an hour so if you've got kids in the car and you're looking for something to do between Gettysburg and maybe DC or Gettysburg and Baltimore side trip to Monocacy um, once COVID restrictions are lifted and the visitor centre is now open you can spend about half an hour in the visitor centre um, the kids can try on some uniforms in there, there's an interactive, interactive battle map and then you can spend another half hour or so just driving the um, four main, five main points on the battlefield itself. So a nice quick tour if you're looking for a side trip from Gettysburg or Washington DC. So um, where are we? Okay, so we're doing a live stream tour today as I said. Um, we're going to get to in-person tours soon, hopefully. Um, we're waiting word on that. But if you're interested in an in-person tour of any of the places that we've been, um, shoot me an email or send me a Facebook message. One caveat, cannot charge for a Gettysburg tour. So um, I'm not doing in-person tours of Gettysburg. All my tours of Gettysburg will just be me rocking up with the phone doing a live stream tour, doing some video and posting those, but um, I'm happy to do tours of Antietam or Sharpsburg, um, Bull Run slash Manassas, um, we can go down to the Richmond unit, we can do the Seven Days Battles, we can do Siege of Petersburg, happy to do all of those, but um, Gettysburg has a nice official tour set up um, with registered battlefield guides for Gettysburg, they do not want to encroach upon their territory, so um, if you're in Gettysburg, take one of their tours. They have fantastic guides there. Um, but, so that's the only one I'm not doing at the moment. Um, but other than that, if you're interested in taking a tour in the area, just give me a shout and we'll see what we can do. We are now... Um, what is today? I think today is the 18th, isn't it? So we're going to take the Wayback Machine. We're on the 18th of May 2021. We're going to take that Wayback Machine to July... 1864, so we're coming up on 157 years ago now. This battle took place three years on from the Battle of Bull Run, so that first major engagement at Manassas Junction between Confederate forces under Beauregard and Johnson versus uh, McDowell's Union forces, and that horrendous defeat for um, the Union. We're three years on from that, and everything has changed. So the tides of war are now flowing definitely in 1864, in the summer of 1864, in favour of the Union. 
um, Grant has fought his overland campaign. Well, no, let's just check back a little bit further than that. So um, if we check back to um, 1863, we know that um, in the summer of 1863, Vicksburg fell to the Union. That split the Confederacy physically in two and gave the Union majority control of the Mississippi River. Uh, we also know that Lee was defeated in July of 63 at the Battle of Gettysburg and that crushed his hopes of a successful um, raid into the North that would bring the North to a negotiating table. And Lee has been forced back into Virginia. General Grant has taken command of all Union armies and he has decided that he will take command in the field and travel with the Army of the Potomac, um, although Meade will remain in command of the Army. So the Overland Campaign has been launched. There have been um, battles at uh, uh, Spotsylvania, Wilderness, we've moved on through the bloodbath at Cold Harbor, and the Union Army has now ensconced itself in siege lines outside of Petersburg, Virginia, south of Richmond. So the Union Army is at the gates of Richmond almost, um, in siege lines, but it does not have sufficient men to, at that period, in the summer of 64, to break that, that siege lines, break into the Confederate lines and capture Petersburg and capture Richmond. So Grant has been working on increasing his forces. He is bringing up 19th Corps from the, from the south to reinforce him. He is stripping the defences of Washington DC of troops that he thinks could be used in the field. He doesn't think that DC is under any threat. So he's taking out artillery troops and garrison troops from the forts around DC um, saying congratulations you're no longer heavy artillery you're now provisional infantry here are some muskets you're now joining the army down in um, Virginia and also US color troops coming into greater numbers and so Grant is increasing his strength around Petersburg in preparation for uh, final battles there and perhaps breaking that Confederate line and ending the war as quickly as he can which puts General Lee in a predicament. So if we're down there in the siege lines at Petersburg, and you think about the Army of Northern Virginia and General Lee, and he's besieged, and it, it's a stalemate, it's effectively a stalemate. Grant doesn't quite have enough troops at this point to attack um, and overwhelm the Confederate defenses, but Lee is fighting a defensive battle. He does not have the manpower to break the siege and break out of the lines and defeat the Army of the Potomac and drive them away from Petersburg. So they're at an impasse. Um, and all that while that that impasse lasts, Lee grows weaker by the day and Grant grows stronger by the day. So Lee knows he has to do something that will draw Union troops away from Petersburg to the north or to a crisis point um, that will draw troops away, that will relax his conditions at Petersburg, perhaps enable him to open up more rail links, recapture a little bit of territory around Petersburg, and open up connections into the south and improve his situation down there. But he needs to force a crisis upon the Union, which will then force Grant to strip troops from Petersburg and send them to the point of crisis. Um, so he comes up with a plan. He hatches a plan with the commander of his second corps, Jubal Early, and they decide that they will detach second corps from the Army of Northern Virginia and Early will take his two divisions into the Shenandoah Valley where he will cause havoc, mayhem, um, frighten the Union and draw troops off. He moves in the, to the valley with those and he joins there with um, so that's Lieutenant General Jubal Early commanding 2nd Corps Army Northern Virginia moves into the Shenandoah Valley where he meets with uh, Major General John C. Breckenridge former Confederate Vice, no, former US Vice President now Major General in the Confederate Army um, he is reinforced by Breckenridge there with two additional divisions so that's um, he has uh, Early has Rhodes Division and Ramsar's Division in his corps. He is reinforced by Breckenridge's own division and also uh, Gordon's division. So that gives him four infantry divisions, plus a brigade of artillery, um, plus three light brigades of cavalry, which he will use for um, scouting and raiding. But 
he now has a significant force concentrated in the Shenandoah Valley. About 15,000 men. Doesn't sound a lot by today's standards, but by the standards of the third year of the war, um, this is a significant body of veteran fighting men. So um, Brackenridge has been having some success in the valley, uh, particularly at the Battle of Newmarket. That's the battle in which the cadets of VMI participated, uh, where he's defeated uh, Siegel. Siegel is relieved of command and David Hunter is appointed in command of the Union forces in the Shenandoah Valley. He fares no better than uh, poor old Siegel and he is defeated at the Battle of Lynchburg which is June, mid-June, 17th, 18th of June um, 1864. Um, David Hunter is defeated at Lynchburg and here's the problem. As you can imagine, the Shenandoah Valley runs south and north, right at the top of the valley. It's Harpers Ferry. You can march up the valley, take Harpers Ferry, cross the river, cross the Potomac into Maryland. Um, logic would dictate, and convention would dictate, and previous experience would dictate that if the Union force is being pushed up the valley, it will continue being pushed until it reaches Harpers Ferry. It will join the Harpers Ferry garrison, put up some kind of defence there on the Potomac. Hunter doesn't do that. Instead of retreating up the valley, Hunter breaks contact with Early, moves across the Shenandoah um, Valley, across the mountains, into West Virginia, breaks complete contact with the Confederate forces. He breaks contact with Washington, D.C. So Chief of Staff Halleck has no idea where he is. General Grant has no idea where he is. They assume he's marched north and will reinforce Harper's Ferry, and they assume that Jubal Early and Breckenridge will remain in the valley. However, Hunter's not there, Early keeps moving. So Early had Breckridge, Early has swept the valley, he's driven Hunter into West Virginia. There is no significant Union force in front of him other than the garrison at Harpers Ferry. He doesn't waste time attacking Harpers Ferry. Um, that would be a, a diversion of brief men and resources for him. He doesn't you know, need to waste time doing that. He knows he can bypass Harpers Ferry and move into Maryland. And so that's what he decides to do. He decides that he will move into Maryland and go from creating havoc in the Shenandoah Valley to creating havoc in Maryland. By moving into Maryland, this will now set alarm bells ringing. He's crossed into Maryland. There are very few forces in the defenses of Washington, D.C., very few forces guarding Baltimore and the Strategic Railroad um, lines that are coming in to Baltimore, the B&O, and the Pennsylvania Wilmington Railroad. So those are very vulnerable to attack. Um, there's scant forces there guarding them in the middle department, um, mostly inexperienced troops, home guard troops, and what we call 100-day men, so short-term enlistment, men that have joined the Union Army for 100-day enlistment, which if you think about it, if you join as a 100-day man from Ohio or Pennsylvania, by the time they've assembled you, put you in a uniform, given you a musket, put you on a train, shipped you down to some point between the Susquehanna River and Baltimore to guard a railroad trestle. Um, you're already probably 30 days into your enlistment then and you haven't really done any military training and you've certainly seen no combat. So these troops are, Early doesn't think that they're going to present any threat to him at all. And in moving in to Maryland he has several options open to him. He can continue north into Pennsylvania, as Lee did in 63, um, when Lee ended up in Gettysburg. So he could move up into Pennsylvania, um, threaten Pennsylvania, perhaps even threaten Philadelphia. Who knows? Um, he could turn and threaten Baltimore. If he threatened Baltimore, he could cut off Washington, D.C. from the north. Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, would be completely cut off. Confederates to the south, Confederates to the north. He could also turn and move on Washington DC itself, knowing that Washington DC is lightly defended, um, there could be a chance of a coup de main. He could march his entire corps into Washington DC and um, capture the nation's capital, which would effectively, I think, have brought an end to the war. I don't think there's any way the Union could have survived and said, well, we're moving the capital temporarily to Pennsylvania. I don't think the North would have survived um, the loss of Washington DC. That would have forced some kind of peace treaty upon them. So Early swept the valley, he's crossed in the Potomac, and you know he says later that he threatened Washington DC, I'm going to read the quote because I can't remember it directly, 
to threaten Washington and if I find an opportunity to take it. I don't know whether he means to take the opportunity to do something or whether to actually physically take Washington DC. Quite ambiguous. So he moves north. Early has 15,000 men under his command, as I said. He's moving towards Frederick, so just up ahead of us. So Frederick lies between um, Baltimore and Gettysburg in that general area. And he could strike against Baltimore, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C. And there are really no troops in this area to prevent him from doing that. So President of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad at that time, John W. Garrett, very influential man, very rich man, obviously. He runs the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. Um, he has effectively his own intelligence service because every switchman, every telegraph operator, every section hand um, can pass a message along the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. If you see any kind of Confederate raider moving your territory, you can pass that message by train or by telegraph very quickly through the Baltimore and Ohio network um, to the president of the Baltimore and Ohio. And he's probably more well informed than um, General Grant, General Halleck, and um, even Abraham Lincoln. So he starts pressing, Garrett starts pressing and saying, there's Confederates up here. I'm like, well, no, they can't be. He's told they can't be. And he's like, I'm telling you that there are, there's like Confederates in significant numbers here. He's finally able to persuade uh, Major General Lou Wallace, who's commander of the middle department. Um, so he has his headquarters in Baltimore itself. He only has about three and a half thousand men under his command, mostly hundred day men, inexperienced troops, as I said, guarding railroad lines, railroad junctions, trestle bridges, etc. Not combat troops, not seasoned troops. But he persuades Lou Wallace that Jubal Early, with 15,000 men, is coming this way. And Wallace has to decide what to do. So he has 3,000, about 3,200 men that he's able to put in the field. 3,000 versus 15,000, he's outnumbered five to one. He knows that any engagement he fights with his inexperienced troops will result in his defeat. There's no way he can win, he knows that. Um, so if he takes the field and faces early, he knows at best what he can do is fight a delaying action and maybe hold early for an hour, half a day, perhaps even a day and with messages being sent by telegraph as quickly as possible south to General Grant, calling for reinforcements for Washington DC and to come up and confront early, um, Wallace hopes that perhaps by the sacrifice of himself and these 3,000 men and a delaying action that might be enough time for Grant to get reinforcements up to Washington DC. Grant is rushing men north as quickly as he can. He has a sixth corps on its way north um, to fill in the Washington defences. He has 19th Corps coming up behind it to also fill out the Washington DC defences. And he's rapidly moving men north into that. So Wallace decides that he's not going to just barricade himself in Baltimore, that he's actually going to come out of the Baltimore area and he's going to find Jubal Early and meet Jubal Early in the field. And Wallace locates really what's a perfect defensive position here at Monocacy. We're actually slightly south of Monocacy as a town, really. We're at what's Monocacy Junction. So there's intersections of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad where it crosses the, um, there's a section house up here, a, a signaling house. There's a railroad crossing, an iron railroad bridge across the Monocacy River. There's a covered road bridge across the Monocacy River. Wallace is coming up from the south and early is coming up from the north, so it's one of those Confederates coming from the north, Union coming from the south situations. And early can put himself behind the bend of the Monocacy River as a defensive line, which will improve the defensive strength of his untrained troops, he hopes. And that means that early will be forced to attack um, across defended bridges and across a defensible river line. And at the last moment, early in the morning, literally at dawn on the 9th of July, uh, Brigadier General Ricketts arrives on the scene with a division, two brigades, a very small division, two brigades of seasoned Sixth Corps infantry, which Wallace desperately needed. 
So that about doubles the size of Wallace's force. He now has about 6,000 men in the field, half very experienced troops, half completely inexperienced troops. And still outnumbered more than two to one, but he believes now that he really can fight this delaying action. He still believes that he will probably lose and be forced back, but he now hopes that he can fight this delay in action, maybe for a day, and give Grant time to bring up more troops into the DC defences. So, here we are, we have um, where I'm standing at the moment, I'm standing at the best farm, so I'm on the north side of the Monocacy River, I'm in the position in which the Confederates are moving across that morning. Behind me, literally 200 feet to my left is the old Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. We've had a couple of coal trains come through this morning, it's very noisy. Um, beyond that is the river, and so it's a very compact battlefield, and uh, troops were in very close contact with each other on this battlefield. So as I said, he maintains a small detachment of troops north of the river to protect the um, signal house and the two bridges. Only about less than 300 men, so he's not going to waste men, he's not going to put a thousand men north of the river to be cut to pieces. He's really putting um, skirmishers and marksmen north of the river to hold back the Confederates from the railroad crossings, from the road, uh, river crossings, from the bridge crossings, and try and uh, back them up with artillery in his main body to the south of the river. So when early arrives that morning, um, not early in the morning, early, early, ha ha ha, um, it's around eight o'clock in the morning, uh, his advanced division is coming down the Germantown Pike, that's now known as Urbana Pike, Maryland 355. They're coming south down the pike. The lead division is Ramsar's division. And as Ramsar's division comes down, marching down Germantown Pike, they run into those Union skirmishers. There's an exchange of fire. Ramsar knows that the enemy is to his front. Um, he sees that the enemy hold the railroad junction, and the road bridge and the railroad bridge and he deploys his division in line to assault that Union position. So, as I said, um, I'm here at the best farm, so I'm north. I'm actually where, um, pretty much, Ramsar's division formed a line of battle on both sides of the Germana Pike and brought artillery in here behind the best farmhouse where I'm standing at the moment, and he put sharpshooters into the... Um, stone barn behind us as well to um, try and deal with these Union skirmishers and these Union troops that were holding the bridges. So I'm going to get a quote from one of the Union troops that was here that morning, it's Private Daniel Freeman of the 10th of Vermont, Vermont, sorry, and he wrote, about 8 o'clock a dash was made by the enemy under cover of artillery fire to drive us from our position, hoping to gain the pike and proceed their way to Washington. So the men knew that that was happening. They knew that they were defending the approach to Washington and they knew that this was essential that they um, stopped those men here on that day. So Early has a choice. He can make a um, frontal attack across those bridges and across the river and try and force that. If you think all the way back to the Battle of Antietam and Burnside's Bridge and the chaos that that could cause, um, Early does not want to do that, so he decides he will not launch a frontal attack across the bridges and across the junction. Excuse me, take a hydration break. He decides he will leave a force here in front of the rail junction, which will pin that Union force in place. So he has riflemen and artillery here at the best farm skirmishing and fighting with the Union forces on the bridges and at the railroad junction. Meanwhile, he'll move his, way, his main body to his right, which is to the west of us, further out um, towards Interstate 270 now, and uh, flanking around the side of us too. So early moves to his right flank, moves his main body of men to his right flank, looking for an open flank to move into. He finds Worthington Ford, which is um, narrows in the water just behind Worthington Farm. So just beyond the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad tracks is Worthington Farm, the next farm. We're at the best farm, the next farm down the pike is the Worthington Farm. First troops across the river at the ford at Worthington Ford are Early's Cavalry. 
they cross mid-morning, um, they dismount, horse holders to the rear, move forward as skirmishers, and they run into a strong Union line behind a rail fence, which drives them back. And this is Ricketts men, this is this experienced veteran Union infantry. So they were not expecting them, and they are driven back. So that then turns into a series now of um, flanking movements as early as continually moving to the right and Wallace is continually shifting his men to the left to counter that movement and they are trying to first of all take control of the Worthington farm um, so the Worthington farm becomes a major centre of Union resistance um, in mid-morning fierce fighting um, hiding in the basement of the Worthington farm is the Worthington family. They're hiding in the root cellar. And six-year-old Glenn Worthington is hiding down in that cellar, thoroughly enjoying the battle, as, as a six-year-old would. Um, peeking out of a boarded-up window in the cellar, watching uh, the artillery fire, watching men running backwards and forwards. Thoroughly enjoys it. Um, it's a seminal moment in his life as a six-year-old. As an adult, he will write um, a book and pamphlets, encouraging Congress to establish a national military park here. At Monocacy, and here we are in Monocacy 157 years later on a national battlefield um, protected by the National Park Service. So, um, perhaps this would be otherwise one of those battlefields which is completely ignored and built over with shopping malls, strip malls, gas stations, the warehouse complexes, and subdivisions of little houses made of ticky tacky. Um, but luckily, it is preserved farmland, open land with um, beautiful preservation here and uh, as I say beautiful battlefield to come visit so after fighting at the Worthington farm the Worthington farm is still held by the Union early continues those flanking movements to his right trying to find a way across um, the Union line trying to find a way across the left of the Union line and it's those series of flanking movements as I said it's kind of like a leapfrog early moves south, Wallace moves south, then moves south, Wallace moves south. So that goes throughout the day. The battle now pivots south of the Worthington farm. Early manages to seize control of the Thomas farm, which is we're at the best farm, then the Worthington farm, you keep going down the pike, you reach the Thomas farm. Early seizes control of the Thomas farm. There's a Union counterattack, there's a Confederate counterattack, there's a Union counterattack, there's a Confederate counterattack. The position changes hands several times during fierce fighting. And that lasts throughout the afternoon. And eventually Early will capture the Thomas farm. And that's really because half of Wallace's force is, as we said earlier, inexperienced, not combat seasoned. So he is numerically outnumbered at the beginning of the battle by at least two to one. Um, if we question the quality of those 100 day men, no disrespect meant to them, I, I know they did their best and their families should be proud of them, but if we just question the overall combat effectiveness that the Union put poorly trained men into the field, so the fault lays with the War Department for putting those men into the field in an unprepared state, not on the men themselves. So if we consider that, then Early has a strong numer numerical advantage of seasoned veteran troops, and that tells. During the afternoon, that actually um, comes into play. His strength finally pushes the Union out of the Thomas farm, and the Thomas farm now, he is completely flanking uh, Wallace's line here and Wallace's line of defence at the Worthington farm. The Confederates control the position at the best farm to the north of the river and the north of the railroad junction. They control the Thomas farm south of the river, south of the railroad junction and blocking the German, German town pike, blocking the turnpike to Washington DC. So Wallace would be unable to fall back on Washington DC and he is effectively flanked on both sides um, numerically disadvantaged, he's done his best, he's been fighting all day, sustaining casualties all day, and he hopes that he's done his job. He hopes that his 
small force, his small outnumbered force, has done enough in delaying uh, Early's troops for this one day on July the 9th. So Wallace orders a retreat. They retreat through Gambrel's Mill. Just if you cross over the uh, railroad track on the new bridge that they're building. Uh, I would like to have filmed today from the 14th New Jersey Monument because it's a beautiful monument that lays down there off of the pike. But because they're putting in a new uh, fancy new uh, piece of infrastructure across the railroad, we're unable to work down there, or film down there today because of the working that's going on. So we're filming up here at the Best Farm. But if you cross over the railroad, and you just go down a short way, half a mile, take a left on Ball Road, and that is effectively the back road to Mount Airy, and then you can take the, um, the National Road. The National Road, which was um, currently US 40, um, if you want to travel the old road, it's, uh, I think it's 144, the old National Road established by Thomas Jefferson all those years ago, you can take that into Baltimore itself. So Wallace falls back on Baltimore at the end of the day, falls back into Baltimore and um, Early has control of the field. Early has victory here at Monocacy, so he can claim a victory. And um, But then you have to ask what kind of victory was there. So it was a victory on the day, so certainly a tactical victory because he was able to flank um, Wallace's forces and uh, outfight them in individual actions, so tactical victory. Operational victory, yes, because at the operational level um, he has defeated Wallace and driven Wallace off the field. Wallace's army, Wallace's forces in no condition to fight again. They've fled back into Baltimore, which again opens up Early's options on that operational level. He can go north to Philadelphia, he can go charging towards Baltimore, or he can go south towards Washington, D.C. So at the operational level, it's a victory. At the strategic level, However, not a victory. Um, he has been delayed for one day. And in that one day period, the rest of the 6th Corps has come up to Washington, D.C. The 19th Corps is on its way into Washington, D.C. And the forts and defences around Washington, D.C., rather than being held by um, Invalid Corps and a handful of clerks and uh, wagoners and mule teams and... Uh, civil service clerks that have come out in the militia to defend those forts, it's now being held by seasoned Union troops and will prove to be impenetrable too early when he advances on that and advances particularly on Fort Stevens three days later. So it will take early time to bring up fresh ammunition and replenish um, his artillery caissons. It will take time for the men to be reprovisioned with um, ammunition for their muskets. They will also need to deal with their wounded here on the battlefield. Um, they will need to eat, they will need to drink. You have 15,000 men in the field, Lord knows how many horses in the field, and you've got to draw all your water either from pumps at farmhouses, which will soon run dry when you over pump, that will run, run those wells dry, or you've got to bring water out of the Monocacy River. So um, it's a hot day here and I'm drinking water that I caught from home, but um, these guys, if they had a water bottle, it would have been long gone by midday. So you have exhausted men that need to rest before they can move, which is why Early cannot move immediately on Washington, D.C. He's fought a battle, his men are exhausted, he has wounded to deal with, he has supply issues, and so he is delayed in total getting to Washington, D.C. for three days. Um, during that time, Early launches some additional efforts. He sends cavalry raids north of Baltimore through what's Baltimore County, north of Baltimore itself. So if you're going around Baltimore, north of the Beltway. So 695 is the road that rings Baltimore. If you're north of the Beltway, that's pretty much where um, early cavalry raids took place. They take place uh, across Baltimore County into Harford County on the banks of the Chesapeake Bay, where his cavalry raiders will burn some railroad trestles, set some trains on fire, cut some telegraph lines, cause some mischief, spread some rumours that they were going to head all the way south um, down through St Mary's County and to Point Lookout and uh, free the 10,000 Confederate prisoners held at the Point Lookout prison camp. That was never going to happen. That's like a 150 mile journey with three or 400 cavalry and 
Johnson's Cavalry Brigade. That was that was never going to happen. But they spread that rumor, so it spreads panic, and uh, spreads panic particularly in Baltimore. So the people of Baltimore barricade the streets of Baltimore, call out the militia, call up as many hundred day men as they can, barricade the streets of Baltimore. But um, Early doesn't advance into Baltimore. Um, he advances around Baltimore um, and marches out on uh, Franklin Pike and then moves south towards Washington DC. He reaches Washington DC three days later on the 12th of July and meets um, a well defended city with um, seasoned troops in that position. So when we're looking at the Battle of Monocacy we are talking about that delay. And as I said right at the beginning when uh, Lou Wallace arrives here with just his 3,000 inexperienced troops he knows he's going to be defeated but he knows he has to fight anyway. He knows he has to put up a sacrificial effort here at Monocacy. Um, he knows that if he can delay if his inexperienced troops can delay early by an hour or half a day that might be all that's needed when he's reinforced by rickets and has some experienced troops as well he hopes to delay early by a day and that's what he does and that delay to Jubal Early's advance prevents Jubal Early possibly from marching into Washington DC or capturing forts on the periphery of Washington DC that are poorly defended by the time Early arrives there those forts are heavily defended and Early has no option. He assaults at Fort Stevens, but it's really not a hard pressed attack. Uh, Grant has brought up 6th Corps, 19th Corps, Washington DC is absolutely saved and uh, is under no threat. So Early doesn't have many options open to him now. Um, more troops are being drawn into the area. The middle department is receiving reinforcements as well, so he can't advance north. Um, the Pennsylvania militia are called out, so he can't advance north, he'd run into them. He can't advance into Maryland because Maryland is being reinforced very hastily. He can't advance into Washington, D.C., so he has to retrace his steps, as all previous invasions of the north have done. So that invasion in 62, where Lee marches across the Potomac and fights at Antietam, He's forced back across the Potomac. He tries again in 63, comes to Gettysburg. That ends up with defeat and returning across the Potomac. And here, even though he early has won a victory at Monocacy, um, his inability to do anything to Washington, D.C. leaves him with little option because his army is now facing strong Union forces. And if necessary, Grant will bring more forces to bear on him and could defeat him in open battle. And so discretion being the better part of valour, early moves back across the Potomac into the Shenandoah Valley. And that is the end of the Confederates 1864 Valley Campaign and its invasion of the North. Um, so really the only major engagements that there are in that, if we discount things like Gilmore's raid into Harford County where he burns two trains, um, we're really just looking at the engagement here at Monocacy on the 9th of July and the engagement at Fort Stevens on the 12th of July. So arguably this is because of that delay that Wallace was able to bring, arguably this is the battle that saved Washington and it deserves um, that name um, because that delay was significant. So the aftermath, well the war will go on a lot longer, the war is still July of 1864 the war's got months and months and months more to run. The Siege of Petersburg has months more to run. So the war itself will continue. It will eventually end. So if we just look at a couple of the figures that were involved in this battle. So Lou Wallace, um, on leading the army, he has appointed um, territorial governor of New Mexico. New Mexico, not a state at this point, just a territory. So he's appointed by the president as territorial governor of New Mexico, which is where he will feature in the Billy the Kid story, and the possibility of a meeting between, we don't know, between Lou Wallace and Billy the Kid, and whether a pardon was promised. So that's a good thing to think about. Get out your 
Young Guns DVD if that's buried at the bottom of your cupboard covered in dust and, and we can relive the 90s together by watching that movie. Um, after that he actually writes a book and becomes a novelist. Writes a book called um, Ben-Hur, The Story of the Christ. So if you know Charlton Heston and you've seen that movie, because they always show it at Easter, they show the Ten Commandments and then they show Ben-Hur, if you've seen that movie with Charlton Heston, that's on Lou Wallace, uh, author of the novel that that movie is based on. Jubal Early, on the other hand, um, the most profane, sweariest, cursinous man in uh, Lee's command, referred to as my bad old man. Lee calls him my bad old man on account of his surliness and his language. Um, when the Confederate armies surrender, Early decides he does not want to surrender. So. He flees first to Mexico, he flees then to, um, where does he go next? Cuba, and then to Canada, and uh, eventually will return home where he will found a publication called the Southern Historical Journal, which will cause many, many, many problems in the years to come through its partisanship, particularly his partisanship, where early is the man that really comes up with the theory of the lost cause that the confederacy could have won if only if not it, if it had not been betrayed if only this happened if only that happened it's a lost cause the south will ride again rise again blah 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 that's on jubal early in the southern historical journal so um, i take no position on the confederacy or the union in this conflict when I'm doing tours, I may in my personal life, uh, but certainly not on tours. So, the Southern Historical Journal basically becomes a place, unfortunately, where former Confederate generals and colonels are uh, continually writing articles and letters criticizing each other and um, in unseemly language creating arguments between men that have been comrades during the war and um, become mortal enemies after the war. You'd think that if you bore animus towards anybody, you would bear animus towards the army that had defeated you. But as so often in human psychology, um, it's that difference between, no, the Union were your opponents. Your enemies were people on your own side. So mm, that's kind of what the Southern Historical Journal turns out to be. And uh, a lot of the lost cause where we talk about in... Um, in the Confederacy um, promulgating this lost cause which may lead to um, the end of Reconstruction, the rise of things like the Klan, um, and Jim Crow laws, uh, segregation and discrimination in the South that's not really counted until the 1960s, so it takes a hundred years to counter this nonsense, or to begin to counter this nonsense, that um, that are as a result of this lost cause um, mentality that comes out of people like Jubal Early, his supporters, and um, it's unfortunate. You know, the war ended and the country should have been a better place, and it um, was not immediately a better place. It took us a long time and it's still taking us time to fix the, the aftermath of this horrible, horrible war. So anyway, enough of me philosophizing, because I always tend to do that at the end of the tour. Um, we can't ask questions because this is just me and a camera, so, you know. Is there anyone here from out of state? Yes, I'm originally from England. Oh, have you visited Monocacy before? Yes, I have visited Monocacy before on several occasions. Well, that's great. Welcome back to Monocacy. Good to see you again, etc., etc., etc. If we are doing the in-person tours, this would be the point at which I'd happily take questions and happily go off topic. Um, discuss other things like Fort Stevens, um, the length of Jubal Early's beard, um, whether Charlton Heston did a good job in Ben-Hur, that chariot race is fantastic, stuntman's name Yakima Canute, great name, and that's why I remember it. Um, we could go off topic in all sorts of ways, answer all sorts of questions. Unfortunately, this is not an in-person tour, this is why I want to get back to in-person tours, and we can ask questions and have a bit of fun and some back and forth. So instead of me standing here for 35 40 minutes talking about the Battle of Monocacy and pointing in different directions. Much better in person when you can actually see 
the things I'm talking about. And um, could be an idea to mount the camera and walk around with the camera, but then you get that ooh, effect, like Blair Witch Project effect, which can, if you're watching, can uh, nauseate you. So we don't want to do that. So thank you for tuning in today to this Battlefield tour, as it was, a um, live stream, free event on Facebook. We have a tour coming up next week, so look on the Facebook page for that. Free live stream tour from Gettysburg, where we're talking about 16th Maine. So I'll actually be in their positions, um, up on towards the railroad cut, then falling back towards the town. I'm going to walk that. If we can walk that, we'll walk that. So it's going to depend upon the weather conditions, of course, whether we can... If it's a nice day, we'll walk it. If it's a rainy, muddy day, we won't walk it. Um, we talk about 16th Maine, the bloody 16th the severe casualties that they took as part of the Union rearguard on that first day. So that's a good story to delve into and look at the personalities involved in that. So that's coming up next week. The week after that we're doing a tour from Fort Mott and then I believe as my son is home from uh, university for the summer, home from Colorado, hi kid, um, that we will be getting out to Gettysburg again and we'll be getting out to Antietam and uh, Hopefully he will join me and shoot some video with me that we can upload to the website. Maybe talk about some of the activities, additional activities at Antietam and at Gettysburg. That, um, my history buff kid that's dragged me out to this battlefield several times when he was younger. Um, it'd be good to do that with him. So thanks for tuning in. See you next week maybe at Gettysburg, the week after in New Jersey. And then who knows during the summer, maybe we'll get back to in-person tours then maybe I'll see you in person. So thanks for coming out today. Um, come again and uh, we'll walk the ground together. Thank you.